Sir John Hayes to move the motion. Sir John Hayes. Uh, uh, Mr Paisley, it's uh, a delight to be able to speak in this chamber on a subject which is not a delight, which is everything but a delight, as I shall articulate briefly in this important debate. So I beg to move this House to consider the impact of immigration on population growth, and it's a pleasure in doing so to serve under your chairmanship, if I may say so. The greatest uh, Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, of course a Conservative, but I suppose that's implicit, said uh, that change is inevitable, change is constant. And I want to speak in the time I have available about the course of change, the character of change, and the consequences of change. Each of us encounter change in our lives. The ultimate change is death. The first change we enjoy is birth. And those between can be either joys or sorrows. But our capacity to adapt to change is not limitless. The enduring touchstones of familiarity help to give our lives certainty. They help to give our lives assurance. And it is vitally important that we understand that, that applies communally, collectively, as well as personally. And yet the changes this country has seen in population growth have been dramatic ones. Uh, so much of the political debate we cherish in this place and thrive upon is about uh, change, by the way. And yet government uh, has made no real measure of the effect of a rapidly growing population and has no mechanism across government to deal with its consequences. When I first ran for Parliament in 1987, and I know there are people in this chamber today thinking, how can that be possible? <laughs> it's true that I was all but a boy uh, in those <laughs> days. Net migration was just 2,000. And up until the mid-90s, uh, migration was essentially balanced. We had people leaving the country and people coming, and that's what all advanced countries enjoy. Uh, it's the inevitable consequence of being uh, a, an advanced economy in particular. When I was first elected to this House in 1997, 10 years later, net migration was 47,000. 10 years later, 10 difficult, some would say tragic years under the stewardship of Mr. Blair, net migration was 233,000. In total, under the last Labour government, total migration was 3.6 million. So that's why nearly a million British citizens emigrated, net migration topped 2.7 million. The rate of inflow between 1997 and 2010 equated to one migrant arriving every minute. And every year since 1997, by one, and that was when the world was locked down, net migration is in excess of 100,000, often by a much bigger margin than that. Indeed, net migration has averaged around 250,000 a year over the past two decades. The most recent figures published by the ONS last month are truly shocking. They, they, they heralded record net migration of 606 600,000. Could my honourable friend give way on that point? I will happily give way. And does my honourable friend find it even more, frankly, anti-democratic that at no point in that whole process that since the 1980s have the electors been asked whether that outcome is what they want? That's entirely true. And indeed, there is a huge gulf between the expectations and the sentiments of the vast bulk of the British population on this subject and those that awful marriage of greedy plutocrats and doubt fueled liberals who seem to think that endless migration is acceptable. And so you, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right that this has been done without consent, indeed without as much as consultation, let alone consent. I happily give way. I commend the Honourable Gentleman for bringing this forward. And I understand the direction he's going, but my understanding is that 1.2 million people migrated into the UK 557,000 left to go elsewhere. That leaves a balance, as the Honourable Gentleman, right, Honourable Gentleman has referred, of 606,000 uh, 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 by the end of June 22. Does he, the Honourable, right Honourable Member, accept that 
many of those people who are coming here have a contribution to make to society here, can build the society alongside us. There are economic migrants, and I understand that they, they are outside of the system, but there are many who want to make a contribution. Does he uh, accept that fact, and does he think that some of the contributions that they make to the NHS, to families, uh, are important as well? Don't yes, of course I accept that, and I'll say a bit more about it later on. Of course it's true that people come here uh, and make remarkable contributions to our, uh, to our communities and to our society. This is not actually about a uh, failure to acknowledge that contribution. It's about dealing with the scale and pace of it. Uh, before it is unheralded, as I say, unprecedented, uh, and it is impossible to sustain uh, this level of migration for reasons I would also set out. Just to be clear about the relationship to population, uh, migration alone accounts for 57 0.5% of the growth in population of England and Wales. And over the 20 years since 2001, the UK population has increased by 8 million, uh, which nearly 7 million was due to immigration. Just imagine that for a moment. Just imagine that figure. To put that in context, that equates to the combined populations of Birmingham, Manchester, Belfast, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Leeds, Leicester, Liverpool, Newcastle, plus Peterborough, Ipswich, Norwich, Luton, and Bradford. A similar, indeed much higher, population increase can now be expected in future years unless we do something radical to address this problem. I happily give way. I thank, thank the member for giving way. And uh, it's in relation to the ratio of numbers of individuals who have come to certain regions of the United Kingdom, and I, I, I'm looking at Northern Ireland in particular, where we have uh, a fairly small population by comparison to me maybe even some of the cities that have just been mentioned, yet we have received a large percentage of uh, people coming in, and I'm talking about illegal immigrants, with 3,356 in Northern Ireland, where we, we were told that we would take 1,000. Those people are in 21 hotels, which is one of our growth industries in Northern Ireland, taking up over 1,100 rooms within hotels in Northern Ireland. That's a big problem that we have. And unfortunately, Scotland uh, have taken a lot less than what Northern Ireland have. So people will try to say, what's going on here? It is not fair. John Hayes. Yeah, well, of course, when people arrive in the country, um, there's no... Uh there's no uh, accounting for where they will choose to go. They would typically go to places where there's work, understandably. We would, after all, too. Uh, and so when I talk of these uh, general numbers, the impact in particular parts of the country, as the Honourable Gentleman suggests, has been much more profound than it has in other places. And back to my point about change, Mr Paisley, the ability to cope with that level of change economically socially and culturally, uh, has placed immense burdens on uh, those communities that have uh, enjoyed the greatest levels of uh, migration. The, the population of this country uh, grew by 606,000 last year. The fact that that's unprecedented is a matter of fact. The fact that it is unacceptable is obvious. The scale of growth will put unbearable pressure on already stretched... I will, in one second, because I just want to illustrate the point I just made, with, uh, and then I'd be happy. Last year, um, I'm sure Jordan may be about to intervene and tell us this, but last year, we built around 180,000 houses. Bear in mind, the population increased by 600,000. We did not and could not build enough surgeries clinics, hospitals, to cope with over 600,000 additional people. We cannot build enough new railways, enough new roads to deal with the extra demand. We are simply adding 600,000 people to an infrastructure already in desperate need of being upgraded. The pressure on the NHS, which the Honourable Gentleman uh, will know a great deal about, is immense. There were 700,000 new GP registrations last year by people entering the country. I happily give way to him. Thank you, I will give way. And I, I, 
I just wonder whether he may also reflect the last year was slightly unusual in the fact that there were, I believe, 130,000 uh, approximately uh, Ukrainian refugees who we were yeah. very rightly took into this country last year. There was also a net inflow of British citizens returning, I believe, of about 90,000. Yeah. Um, and there were other refugees from Afghanistan and from Hong Kong, who we um, were quite rightly as a country uh, held out our hand uh, to give refuge to. Um, so I, 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 but I think just on the wider point, I just find my Muslim friend is, is running slight risk of um, potentially um, uh, suggesting that immigration per se is bad when we recognise that people who come here and work hard for the NHS um, uh, can make a great contribution to our country and that, fact, frankly, a number of our public services couldn't operate without them. Well, people come with an economic uh, 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 need as well as providing an economic benefit. There's a cost and benefit to every uh, one in, individual in this room and in every uh, person who arrives in the country. Uh, the degree of cost they bring will depend on their circumstances. Uh, so um, if someone comes who's sick or elderly or infirm, their demand on the NHS, for example, is much greater. If someone comes who's young and fit, uh, economically active and skilled, their contribution to the economy will be much greater. The Honourable Gentleman was right that last year was exceptional for the reasons he'd given. But when I spoke of uh, a typical figure over the period I've described of 250,000, you would understand that's the size of several substantial cities. Just housing those people alone is proving impossible. And the biggest single driver of housing demand is migration and has been for a very long time indeed. The, uh, on, the, on health too, uh, he's right that uh, our health service benefits immensely uh, from people born overseas. Both of my sons were delivered by people uh, born overseas. Well, I've been treated by all kinds of specialists, doctors, nurses and others born overseas, as have members of my family. I, can, I, I thank them for that service uh, and I uh, fully recognise and appreciate the contribution they've made. I think it's very important, though, to say in respect of that, that the reason why that contribution is required is we have palpably failed to train up homegrown people who could absolutely take the same jobs. And so we fall into a lazy argument, does my friend agree, if we simply just talk in platitudes rather than looking at the lives and opportunities of our citizens. Well, the Honourable Gentleman's intervention encourages me to digress, but to digress within the scope of the matter before us, if I might, Mr Pateley, because there is a macroeconomic lesson that needs to be taught to the Treasury and the OBR. There is a lazy assumption that increasing population is uh, automatic good for the economy. And it's certainly true that you can grow an economy by those means. But that doesn't mean per capita growth. It means growth of an altogether cruder kind. Moreover, the macroeconomic fact is that if you do that, you displace investment in recruitment, in skills, and in modernising the economy. You stultify the economy in a high labour mode. And Britain's chance to succeed and prosper in the future is a high-tech, high-skilled economy. Rather than displacing our attention and subsequently policy and investment in those skills by recruiting labour from abroad, we should indeed look closely at the kind of economic future we want to build and drive policy forward around that, uh, that future. And so the Honourable Gentleman is right to draw attention to the myth which uh, pervades the economic debate about migration. I want to make two more points, however, Mr Paisley. Uh, uh, one is around uh, the, uh, the likely future population. Well, Look, I will make this one point and then, and then do so. Experts estimate the UK population could grow from 67 million to between 83 and 87 million by 2046 if current immigration trend continue. Growth to 80 million plus will result in the need to build between 6 and 8 million more homes. That's equal to between 15 and 18 more cities the size of Birmingham by 2046. This is by far the biggest challenge facing the government. I do not say that lightly. 
or blithely. I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and it is on this very point that I would like to both expand and return to the issue of housing. Um, my right honourable friend might uh, be interested to know of a visit I made to a housing development site in the Midlands where the vast majority of sales were to British national overseas people from Hong Kong who were buying homes en masse on a development. Um, and when that development had been planned, it was not known that this migration route would be open. And that was not the uh, population, therefore, that the planners had in mind. Does this not illustrate the challenges of long-term planning, how long it takes to build the homes we need, and these very quick changes in the migration pattern and the impact that he's described? Well, it, I, I agree with my honourable friend, and I, I pay tribute to the work she's done in her constituency and more widely to highlight these issues. Put this in perspective, Mr Paisley. If the UK continues to... Uh, welcome the number of people uh, that we are now, we would need to build 6.5 million more homes solely to cope with population growth over the period. Current levels of immigration require home people in England every five minutes to meet skyrocketing, skyrocketing demand. By contrast, even modest changes, such as cutting net migration levels back to 100,000, would help. This would help young people to get on the property ladder and preserve more of our countryside from being lost forever to house building. Given the dramatically increased numbers of those coming here, driving immigration up to levels never seen before in British history, urgent action must be taken. I look forward to hearing what urgent action my right honourable friend has in mind, but let me make some suggestions to him of what could be done. Some work's been done already due to the exceptional Home Secretary and Immigration Minister that we are proud to have yeah. as members of the government. The reduction, the measures to limit master's degree students from bringing uh, their dependents is welcome but insufficient. As I said at the time, it is odd, I'll put it no more strongly, that those who are studying taught masters can no longer bring their dependents, but those who are studying research masters can. And frankly, we need to be more uh, bold altogether. We need to raise the, uh, raise the wage threshold for those entering the country on employment visas. We need to look closely at the health services and the charges that, that pertain in respect of the access to the health service, as is, after all, a national, not an international health service. Uh, we need to uh, focus on uh, building domestic skills as my, as my honourable friend said, which reduces the need uh, to uh, bring people into the country uh, with skills that should be homegrown. We certainly need uh, to look at uh, uh, the uh, number of spouse visas issued and look at the criteria for issuing those kind of visas. And, and more than all of that, we need to recognise that people coming here can do an important job for us and welcome them accordingly. But know, too, that they will be disadvantaged. They, too, will be disadvantaged if the, if the infrastructure creaks and creaks the point of breaking due to this unprecedented level of population growth. The, uh, the best... Uh, way forward would be for the government to take a holistic look at this challenge. My good friend Lord Hodgson of Astley Abbotts has spoken about this and in an excellent paper that he published through the think tank Civitas uh, spoke of the need for an office for demographic change along the lines of the office of budget responsibility. It would be mission to establish proper evidence provide expert advice and to recommend actions taken across government and other agencies to deal with population change, drawing up long-term strategies to meet the needs that are inevitably the product of population growth. I'd be interested to hear the Minister's views on that very sensible idea uh, devised by my honourable friend. And we need to reduce the period that graduates can stay after completing their degrees from two years to about six months. And we must uh, 
look again at the shortage applications for skilled workers routes, assuring that we are bringing people into the country where strictly necessary and not allowing corporate businesses uh, to simply hire cheap labour. There is a real evidence of declining working conditions. This point has been made by the Shadow Minister, by the way, uh, very well, I thought, of working conditions and salaries and so on being detrimentally affected by the fact that some of the people I earlier described as greedy plutocrats, that was an understatement, by the way, um, uh, who would rather employ people on the cheap than do the right thing by their workers. And I thought the Shadow Minister made a, a very uh, strong case for that when he spoke about it recently in the House. So Disraeli also said, the man is not the creature of circumstances. Circumstances are the creatures of men. The prevailing circumstances this country faces in respect of population growth cannot be ignored any longer. We need the leadership, which I know that my right honourable friend is well placed to offer, across the whole of government, because this affects every aspect of government. We've spoken about health, we've spoken about housing, we've spoken about infrastructure. I could have spoken about transport. Every time someone complains about roads, and how often do they complain about potholes and roads, know that every extra 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 people using roads puts extra pressure on the infrastructure. And I could pick almost every aspect of government, every government department. We need urgent action, as I've said, for if we don't, not only will we fragment our society, undermine our sense of shared belonging, alter our communities forever. But more than that, we will not be able to sustain the good quality of life which British people rightly expect and, by the way, want government to help them enjoy. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Sir John. This debate has a hard stop at five minutes to six. I intend to call Alison Thoulos at 32 minutes past the hour or thereabouts. So, members, monitor yourselves. Scott Benton. Thank you, Mr Paisley. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. May I begin by congratulating my honourable friend for South Holland and the Deacons for securing this debate. It's good to see him leading the, issue on, leading the debate on this issue like he does on so many others. In any advanced modern economy and free society, people come and people leave. This has always been the case in this country and for the vast majority of our history, the numbers of those coming and going has more or less been broadly imbalanced, as my honourable friend said. Sadly, for much of the last 25 years, this has not been the case. The Blair government famously admitted to sending out search parties in an effort to bring immigrants here and to deliberately engineer mass immigration to change the fabric of our society. And sadly, for all of the promises over the last 13 years, this trend has broadly continued. Last year, a staggering 1.2 million people came to the UK, equivalent to the population of Birmingham, or 10 times the population of Blackpool. Net migration totaled 606,000, a colossal number and simply unprecedented in modern times. Although last year's figure was somewhat of an anomaly, the general trend for much of the past two decades has been for net migration to be in excess of 250,000, as my honourable friend has said. This is simply not sustainable in any way, shape or form. And it is the British people, those who place their trust in us to control immigration, who are suffering the consequences of this failure. There is much talk at present of a housing crisis, and while supply-side issues such as a lack of planning reform, comparatively low numbers of new builds, and the government's ill-advised interventions in the private rented sector have all contributed to this, it is clear that immigration is the elephant in the room. You can't allow the population to grow by the equivalent size of Glasgow, as we did last year, and then wonder why on earth there is a housing shortage which is causing misery to so many people. But it's not just housing which is at breaking point. 
Our public services are also creaking under the strain of mass immigration. Take the NHS. Waiting lists are at a record high. Yes, partly as a consequence of the pandemic, but the trend was long in evidence well before then. Whilst in some of our schools, I know as a former primary school teacher, much of the additional investment and funding which has been put in over the last decade has been directed to specialist tuition and support for children who have arrived here without mastering the basics of the English language. There have also been profound impacts on our labour market. Reduced investment in technological innovation due to an over-reliance on cheap foreign labour. This has hurt productivity and suppressed wages for working people in all sorts of sectors, as I see from my own local economy in Blackpool. We have to wean ourselves off this dependency on low-skilled foreign labour and an economic model which is sadly broken. The immense demands placed by such high levels of immigration on housing and our public services are recognised by the British people who are frankly fed up with the situation. Time after time, they have stated they want less immigration and time after time, they are left disappointed. The Brexit referendum in 2016 was perhaps the clearest illustration of this, with many voting to leave, myself included, precisely on the basis of the promise to control immigration. And whilst we have ended free movement of people, which is to our credit, it is no good swapping high levels of EU immigration for high levels of migration from the rest of the world. Many of those who voted to leave and indeed supported our party in 2019, many for the first time, partly on our basis, uh, on the basis of our manifesto pledge to control immigration, understandably feel bitterly disappointed by our inability to control net migration. And frankly, who can blame them? Sustained high levels of immigration has changed the nature of some of our communities forever. And when new arrivals haven't always integrated within those communities, this has on occasion created significant problems. The frustration that so many ordinary people feel is exacerbated by the fact that too few people in the liberal metropolitan political establishment across all political parties are prepared to face up to the consequences of high immigration. People have been far too squeamish to confront its realities out of a misguided sense of political correctness. And sadly, some of those who have indeed recognised the impact this has had have further eroded public trust with their failed promises to tackle the issue. Sadly, our failure to stop the small boats is the most obvious outlook, outlet rather, for their anger and frustration at present. We've rightly made stopping the small boats a key priority, and I commend the Minister for leading the way on this. But we will not only be judged on this aim, but also on our promises to reduce net migration. Time and patience of the British people is sadly running out. James Dealey. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Paisley. And when I, I didn't come here to talk in figures, I came to talk what I believe is the important factor that has dominated the debate on immigration in Parliament for the last 20 to 30 years, is the complete ignoring of vast sections of the population by the people who sit in this chamber. The people who sit in this chamber, um, in terms of their attitude to immigration, have often refined it... Normally, I agree with the great Edmund Burke, and Mr. Mr. Paley, please forgive me for reading this. But in 1774, he said, your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. And within that, spe that, within that speech also, he, meant, he used the, the, the phrase, which I think should be a, a flashing red light for all politicians, his enlightened conscience. What we have seen in Parliament for the last 20 to 30 years are people who believe they have enlightened consciences making decisions on the basis of their own ideological um, views at the expense of their constituents. Throughout the whole period, I've repeated this continually, but I, I cannot be the only MP. When I first became involved in politics in Bury in 2010, as all people do who, who get involved in political parties, I travel around the north of England, without a shadow of a doubt, nearly every single door I knocked on, immigration was the issue. And what was the issue? It wasn't a nuanced debate. It wasn't, let's talk about this, let's talk about how many people in the NHS. It was essentially, there are too many people coming into this country, and we are extremely concerned about it. 
And we are going back over a decade. I remember, Mr. Paisley, when I was growing up, that it was something you couldn't discuss. You can't mention things to do with immigration or to do with race, because you're, you're almost certainly a racist, and there was a chorus of people only too willing to challenge you on that basis. I think this government um, faces a real decision in respect to where it wants to go in terms of representing the opinion of the British people and representing constituents such as mine in Barrie, my humble friends uh, in Blackpool and others. We either have to decide that we take a view, and it's a perfectly intellectually coherent view, which I'm sure will be articulated by the Scottish National Party and the Labour Party, that, that immigration is a matter of conscience, it's a matter of morality. And again, when that comes into any debate in this place, I shrink away from that. My morality may well be very different to yours, Mr Paisley, may well be very different to anybody else's. Anybody else who decides policy on the basis of their own prejudices is somebody who I think is to be questioned and to be uh, thought of in a, <laughs> as, a, as a politician that is not serving their people. A politician that looks at immigration in the correct way is a politician that looks at it in the not only taking into account the, account the views of their constituents and people within the country, but the practical consequences and my honourable friend, and my honourable friend from South Holland and the Deepings, has set out the practical consequences. But in the debate, in this chamber, especially from opposition parties, those two things are ignored. And I often wonder with the Labour Party, when they look over and they look at why Brexit happened and why, you know, why we had the majority that we had in 2019, I can tell you, it's because, especially in the north of England, Labour politicians for 40 years ignored their own constituents' views. Not only ignored their own constituents' views, it considered them to be racist. That is the basis of the Labour Party's downfall. That was the basis of what made Brexit happen. And it will be a great tragedy if this government, under the excellent minister, and I mean that, this is a genuinely great man and a great minister, if we do not respond to what the people, they put their trust in us for this issue. Going back very briefly to the issue of Brexit, I often hear in this house with some of my great colleagues who fought great titanic battles and talk about uh, reg regaining our sovereignty, Brexit was about immigration. It was about, we can care ourselves about anything else. In Blackpool and Berry, it was about immigration. That's what shifted the votes in their millions. And we never hear about it in this chamber. We talk in nuanced terms, which excludes the voters completely from the debate. And then we wonder why the voters look at this place like they do. Because the people in this chamber do not represent the views of the people in this issue. They are, as Burke said back in 1774, they are people who consider themselves to have an enlightened conscience who ignore the views of their constituents and prefer, will prefer to judge policy by their own perceived morality and their own perceived judgment and to hell with the consequences for housing, for opportunity, for skills and for all the other things. And who are the people who sacrifice because of this ideology that has, list, that has gone on in this country for 40 to 50 years? It's the poorest. And that is what the true shame of the policy has been. It must change. Uh, Mr Pace, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and it's great to be able to participate in this debate and I congratulate my right honourable friend on, on introducing uh, this debate. I wish to concentrate on the issue of the population because I think that's the core issue we've got to address. And if one looks back at 1990, which is the base date, of course, for all our policies relating to net zero and uh, so-called climate change, uh, the population then was about 20% less than it is now. There's been a 20% increase in population uh, since then, and yet all our net zero targets are related uh, to uh, absolute figures rather than uh, CO2 emissions uh, per head of population. And that's a dimension to this debate which I don't think we have sufficiently addressed. And when the uh, Environmental Audit Committee, on which I have the privilege of serving, was asking uh, the Environment Minister the other day about uh, what is being taken into account in terms of the impact of rising population on the ability of the government to deliver its net zero targets, uh, there was a big um, gasp oh, well, there's no briefing on that, didn't have a clue. And, and all that happened was that the minister resorted to talking uh, about heat pumps 
dare one say it, Mr. Paisley. He, he seemed to think that uh, the answer to this issue, which I raised, uh, was to refer to the issue of heat pumps. And yet we know uh, that the issue of heat pumps is a, a subsidiary one. And it's rather like the government keeps setting targets for almost everything under the sun. And recently, in, yesterday, in fact, I visited a garden centre. And the government is prescribing uh, the amount of peat that you can have in a grow bag. It's, it's prescribing that, but it has got no policy whatsoever in relation to the number of people we think it is a right to have in, in our country. And I was visiting Hungary with some colleagues a few weeks back, and in Hungary they do have a strong population policy. And uh, the, the, the Prime Minister there, who uh, recently got re-elected uh, with a two-thirds majority in, in Parliament, he has got the support of his people in recognising that you can limit immigration and at the same time grow your population and grow your economy. And the point my right honourable friend uh, made about uh, the growth in the economy, I think that is one of the uh, most destructive policies that this government is adopting. It's talking about GDP growth as being a good thing, but actually what should really count is the GDP growth per person, per capita. And if one looks at the figures, um, Mr. Paisley, you will see that over the last 10 years, effectively, GDP per head of population has been static. So we haven't had that growth. And so when people feel that they haven't shared in the growth, the answer is no, they haven't, because the growth is actually being generated to a large extent by just having more people in the country. And so we can, the government can brag about the fact that we've got higher growth than in Germany, but actually that growth is a mirage because it's not the growth per head of population in, in terms of the economy, it's the overall growth created by just bringing more people uh, in, into the country. So this is a, an overdue but very uh, timely uh, debate and the contribution that net migration makes to population growth is, is important. But let's first of all get a policy relating to a population. We haven't had a, pop, uh, a population policy in, in this country and uh, why don't uh, government ministers go off and see what they're doing in, in Hungary where they are addressing this uh, problem in a really constructive way incentivizing the homegrown population to grow their families whilst at the same time having tight control over uh, migration from outside and encouraging people to develop their skills instead of uh, allowing employers to take the easy shortcut of bringing in people who are already trained from overseas, thereby denuding uh, those economies of uh, the, that skill set. So there's a lot to be done, uh, and I don't know whether my right honourable friend in responding to this will be able to promise that we will introduce a population policy. I hope he will. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Paisley. It's a pleasure to see you in the chair. And oh my goodness, where to start with this debate? Where to start with this debate? Well, I will start uh, with my own constituency of Glasgow Central, in which 24.7% of the population were born outside the UK. The honourable member who brought this debate had 8.9% of the population born outside the UK in his constituency. The honourable member for Blackpool South, 5.7%, Buddy North, 8.4%, Christchurch, 5.5%, and the minister. 5.7% uh, born outside the UK from his constituency. So before we get started on any of this, I will not take any criticism from anybody about immigration or attitudes towards it in Scotland, because I'm in a far stronger position to talk about these issues than any of them are, given the demographics of my own constituency. The way in which the, the uh, Honourable Member approached this debate to talk about the, the lack of um, housing, the lack of health capacity, the lack of schools. These are all infrastructure problems caused in huge part by the lack of investment by the party that has been government in the UK now for the past 13 years. That has not kept pace with population growth in this country and it is to this government that he should be addressing those concerns because that, in, that infrastructure investment has not been made. That's why there's not enough housing because he and his colleagues stand up and go, oh, we don't want any housing in our constituencies. We don't want housing here in this place or that place or another place. And then they wonder why there's not enough houses. An absolute mystery, I must say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Paisley. Moving on to... Uh, 
No, I will not. Moving on, to, I listened in patience to his comments, and I'm, uh, he can listen in patience to mine. He talked about skills and labour uh, and the issues there, and yes, I agree. There needs to be more investment in skills in the population. Again, that has come at the cost of this government cutting back on infrastructure and education over all these years, so people have not been able to go into that. It has come for, in nursing, for example, in the UK government, removing nursing bursaries. We kept those in Scotland, and people are going through that system and becoming nurseries, much as we so need them. He's talked about uh, the, the fact that people here perhaps aren't having children. Gosh, is that perhaps because there are no nursery places for them? Because this government has failed to invest in those nursery places. The lack of childcare is stopping women having children. And that is a significant problem that this government has caused. He, is also talk he talked about um, uh, the issue of, of families here not having children and those, those demographic challenges. Other members have talked about that. Um, other members have talked about the issues of, fam of smaller... Of course. I, I, I'm very... I mean, hyperbole is one thing, calumny is another. And, uh, and I didn't mention people in this country not having children. I didn't mention families. So I don't know whether this yes. is uh, an I'm invention or misunderstanding. I'm happy to withdraw... I'm happy to withdraw... Yes, of course. You know that is not a point of order. Um, let's keep this debate... People were listened to quietly, and all their points were made, allowed the Scottish representative to make the points quietly and with dignity. Thank you. Alison Thulos. Thank you kindly. I will accept that perhaps he did not make that point. Other of his colleagues made that point uh, around demographics. Perhaps that could be to because uh, people have been demonised for having children in this country through the two-child limit, which has reduced the family size in this country and has an impact on the number of people in those poorer demographics having children because there is not the support for that through the social security system. Uh, there is a cost of living crisis. Perhaps members opposite haven't quite noticed that, which again is meaning that families are holding off having children uh, because they don't feel that they can afford them. Um, we've talked about the, the issues of housing policy in the UK, of chopping and changing and targets moving and shifting and disappearing, uh, whereas in Scotland we have built lots of social housing uh, in Scotland and we have invested in that sector and we have stopped things like the right to buy that removed affordable housing from many communities in England. Uh, in Scotland, uh, we have issues uh, around immigration, but our problems are around, are around emigration, not immigration. And for generations, depopulation of areas like our islands. And for that reason, uh, the Honourable Member for Christchurch, I'm sure, will be very pleased that Scotland has a national action plan and population strategy that we have started because we are losing people, not because we, need, we uh, want to close the door and prevent them from coming in. We want the dev devolution of immigration law to allow us to tackle uh, issues like this, to allow us to tackle the depopulation uh, of our island communities and put further investment into those. Brexit is the elephant in this room in many ways, but not in the, the way that honourable members opposite seem to think. Because de Brexit has, mean, has meant a loss of skills, has meant people feeling unwelcome, has, mean, has meant that qualified staff in universities have gone elsewhere because they cannot further reser their research in universities in the UK. The honourable members opposite mentioned graduates uh, who they want to seem to take international student fees and then kick them out. That's not a way to welcome people and to thank them for choosing to come and be in this country. And I should say, around the issues of students and dependents, I asked um, the minister a question on this, a written parliamentary question, to ask how the government calculates the amount brought to this country in terms of the immigration health surcharge and dependent visas. They couldn't draw out that number from their immigration figures, so there is no evidence to suggest uh, dependents of students are in any way any kind of burden because the government can't produce that in information when asked. And it is a fact that you're more likely to be treated by an immigrant in hospital than find one in the bed next to you because they come here and they help out our health service to a ridiculous degree, if indeed they're allowed to work, because I have constituents just now who are waiting for home office provision to be allowed to work in the NHS uh, and would dearly love to be able to be using their skills uh, to help people in Scotland uh, but are not being permitted to do so at a time when we have uh, health and social work with the highest number of vacancies in September, November 2022, with um, 3.9 vacancies for every 100 employee jobs. And those uh, skills gaps are, are right across the other sectors in our society as well. There are huge job shortages. We need people to be coming in here and working because those vacancies and those vacancy rates have a significant impact on the um, 
the productivity of the UK on GDP growth, as other members have mentioned, but we're refusing to take those skills and we're refusing to let people come in and we're closing the door upon them. And that makes me incredibly sad because that is not what Scotland chooses. And people talked about speaking about immigration on the doorsteps, Mr Paisley. I go around the doorsteps in my constituency just the same and I listen to people and their concerns and they accept that immigration is important that people come to Scotland to contribute skills and jobs. People in Pollock Shields accept, uh, allow, love the joy of being able to go and buy fresh mangoes and pakora on their doorstep. They welcome all of these things that immigrants bring to enrich our culture. And it makes me incredibly sad that the members opposite don't think that immigrants have anything to bring. Mr Paisley, I want to close with some words from the proclaimers. All through the story, the immigrants came, the Gale and the Pict, the Angle and Dane, from Pakistan, England and from the Ukraine, we're all Scotland's story, we're all worth the same. Your Scotland's story is worth just the same. Person, Stephen Kennock. Stephen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Paisley. It's a pleasure to serve under your uh, chairship, and I'd like to uh, congratulate the Right Honourable Member for South Holland and the Deepings on securing this, this vitally important debate, uh, and to, uh, to thank all Honourable Members uh, for their contributions. That net migration is currently at its highest level on record is beyond question. Given that historically the number averaged around uh, 200,000 uh, per year, I'm of course not going back as far as uh, the Right Honourable Member for, for South Holland and the Deepings did, but uh, looking across uh, recent years and, and looking at the average numbers, around 200,000 per year, uh, and of course we saw the figures uh, this year coming out at 606,000. It is therefore entirely fair to ask questions about why that number has grown by so much and whether continued growth in the numbers would be sustainable over time. Now, debates on this issue can always be contentious, as I think we've, uh, we've just seen, but I hope that we can all agree on the need to have a well-informed discussion that is based on facts and evidence and driven by an honest assessment of the trade-offs that lie at the heart of this issue. Unfortunately, though, our national conversation on immigration is too often characterised by oversimplification and false binaries. For example, it's clear that a substantial proportion of the public are concerned about the current level of migration overall, and their worries are entirely legitimate, given the amount of pressure there is on our social infrastructure following 13 years of successive Conservative governments hollowing out our public services and utterly failing to build enough affordable housing. However, it is equally true that we are confronted by a demographic challenge when we consider that the replacement rate, that is the ratio of birth to deaths, has been below one to one for the last 50 years. And the dependency ratio, or the number of working people per retiree, has fallen from roughly 15 to one at the time that Lloyd, Lloyd George introduced the first state pensions over 100 years ago to around four to one by the time this government came into office in 2010. So rather than take a narrow, blinkered, partisan position that dismisses one of these factors in favor of the other, we need to see the immigration question through the prism of competing priorities that have to be well managed so that we get the balance right and deliver the best possible outcomes for our country. And it's also vital that we avoid the temptation to see immigration policy as something that operates in isolation from other policy challenges. Rebuilding our public services and housing infrastructure after 13 years of Tory neglect will be a top priority for the next Labour government. And we're absolutely clear that doing so will also help to build more cohesive community relations. Mr Paisley, the competing priorities that underpin immigration policy are perfectly illustrated by the points-based system for skilled workers. Labour supports the points-based system. Indeed, we created it in 2008 for non-EU citizens. But it's clear to us that the way in which this government is managing the system is simply not working because ministers have failed to engage with employers and trade unions such that our economy gets the overseas labour it needs whilst ensuring that those key stakeholders are bringing forward workforce plans and skills plans, productivity plans and training strategies that maximise opportunities for our homegrown talent. As a result, for too long employers have seen immigrant labour as a substitute for investing in local workers. And it's also clear that with 7 million on the NHS waiting list and over 2 million people on long-term sick leave, we urgently need a Labour government so that we can implement our New Deal for Working People 
as set out by my colleagues, the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Secretaries of State for Health and for Work and Pensions. Turning now to our broken asylum system, it was this government that gave us new legislation, the Nationality and Borders Act, which we were told would increase the fairness and efficacy of the asylum system, break the business model of the people smuggling gangs, and remove more easily from the UK those with no right to be here. Well, it's one year almost to the day since that legislation came into force, and yet here we are again, with new legislation and the same old promises from ministers, as if none of it had ever happened. So where the benches opposite offer nothing but platitudes and more broken promises, a Labour government will act decisively to deliver an immigration system which is fair, affordable, sustainable and above all fit for purpose. We will reform the points-based system, ending the disparity between rate, wage rates paid to migrant and non-migrant workers in order to prevent undercutting and abuse. And we will engage with employers and trade unions to deliver workforce plans that strike the right balance between inflows and homegrown talent. Equally, if not more important, we will deliver a comprehensive workforce plan to upskill our homegrown workforce and equip the next generation with the skills and knowledge to meet the long-term demands of an ever more interconnected global economy, where specialist knowledge and skills are at a premium. Now, as I said earlier, public concern about immigration is focused on a range of issues, including both economy-driven economy -driven immigration and asylum. But far from stopping the boats, as is so often promised, the Conservatives' bigger backlog bill will deliver nothing more than chaos, if inefficiency, unfairness, and further cost to taxpayers. So we need Labour's five-point plan in order to stop the dangerous channel crossings by delivering on those uh, tasks which are based on common sense, quiet diplomacy, rather than chasing headlines and the government by gimmick that the immigration minister is so fond of. Now, the economic impact assessment, which was finally, although belatedly, published yesterday, demonstrated beyond any... Ri I will give way. Are you asking what the plan is? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm just checking my time, but uh, the, the five-point plan is to scrap the unworkable, unethical and unaffordable Rwanda plan and channel the funding into the NCA. It is to um, triage the backlog so that there is much faster processing of high grant rate and low grant rate countries and to reverse the catastrophic decision that was made in 2013 on uh, case workers and decision makers downgrading their seniority, thus leading to a, a, a collapse in productivity and poorer decisions being made. It is about making the resettlement schemes work. The Afghanistan scheme has completely collapsed, which is frankly shameful given that we owe a debt of gratitude to those, uh, to those people in Afghanistan. Uh, it is to get a returns deal with the European Union, which we know has to be based on uh, having safe and controlled legal pathways. And it is to get our aid programme working so that we're focused, particularly in countries that are generating large numbers of uh, refugees, uh, rather than plundering the aid budget, which is currently being used to fund hotels in Order. this country. Order. I thank the member for his comments. I have to call the minister at this point. Minister, you have about 11 minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Paisley, and to my right honourable friend, the uh, member for South Holland and the Deepings, for bringing this debate forward and for the kind words that he said. Uh, flattery, of course, will get you everywhere. Um, <laughs> there are few more important uh, decisions for this parliament to make than who gets to come to our country, and that's why this debate is so critical. And I think he's right in his central argument that immigration has generally occurred over the decades in this country in an ad hoc manner without the careful thought and planning that it warrants. Sometimes it's been successful, sometimes less so, but it's rarely been planned in the way that it should do. And as has been said, the levels of immigration that we are currently seeing and have seen for most of my adult lifetime are very significantly higher than for the rest of the history of this country. The level of net migration that we've seen in the last 25 years is not normal by historical standards. And it's right that we consider the consequences of that and whether that we should take action to change that. He made the point that uh, Lord Hodgson of Astley Abbotts had proposed to create an organization to consider more deeply the demographic 
changes that we're experiencing as a country. And in fact, I've met Lord Hodgson to, to discuss just that. I know Lord Hodgson well, having grown up uh, not far from Astley Abbott, uh, where his, uh, his mother created the most northerly lavender farm in Europe uh, in her 80s. Uh, but that's, that's by the by. Uh, but his proposal, I think, is a very important one and one worthy of further consideration. It is something that the Migration Advisory Committee could play a greater part in considering when they advise government on uh, changes to our immigration system. But if not them, then I think there is a good argument for uh, a separate organisation. And that's one that I've, uh, a topic I've, uh, I've committed to Lord Hodgson to give further thought to. He raised, very importantly, as did a number of other colleagues in this debate, the profound consequences that large quantities of migration have upon the population of this country in terms of housing, in terms of access to public services, and in terms of integration, cohesion, and unity. And on each of those points, I think we should take very serious consideration. Housing is a topic that I have uh, paid particular interest to throughout my time as a minister. And it is undoubtedly true that if we see 600,000 people, additional people coming to this country every year, that that has profound consequences for house prices, and in particular for the poorest in society who either want to get onto the housing ladder or to access social housing. And we have to take that seriously. I made a speech recently at Policy Exchange about the impact of illegal migration. And although different, many of the same arguments are true with respect to legal migration. We have to make sure that we are representing our constituents' true opinions correctly, as the Honourable Gentleman said. And we have to be cognizant of the consequences in terms of the pressure on public services, housing and integration. Secondly, he made the argument that, again, the government would agree with, that companies shouldn't reach in the first instance for the easy lever of foreign labour. That is not the route to productivity enhancements and prosperity. If it was, then this country would be even more prosperous than it is today, given the large amounts of legal migration that we've seen in the last 25 years. We have to encourage companies to embrace technology, automation, and the training and investment in skills of their staff. The government is doing that in a number of different ways, through the skills reforms that we're taking forward, such as for apprenticeships, which in fact uh, the right honourable gentleman uh, started when he was the apprentice minister uh, many years ago. And now the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions has made it one of the central missions of his tenure to ensure that we get more of the economically inactive in our country back into the workplace and ensure that businesses support them in the first instance rather than reaching uh, for those overseas. The most crucial reform that we've done as a government in this parliament was taking back control. It was as a result of leaving the European Union that for the first time in my lifetime, governments of this country can control the levers which dictate the numbers of people coming into our country. And that is an absolutely essential change. It is now in our hands, but there has been a lazy assumption that control alone was sufficient and that people were not concerned about numbers. I disagree with that. The government does as well. We believe that net migration is far too high and that we need to take action to bring it down over the medium term. It is correct, as others have said today, that the levels of net migration we've seen in the last two years have included some exceptional factors that the kaleidoscope was shaken as a result of COVID, and that we have subsequently seen very large numbers of people returning to the UK, such as students. We've made important commitments, such as creating the Ukraine scheme, the Hong Kong scheme, the Afghanistan scheme, all of which we should be proud of and command high levels of public support. In fact, the UK, contrary to the view that you sometimes hear expressed on the left, is one of the world's leading countries for humanitarian protection schemes. 
Since 2015, under a Conservative government, we have enabled half a million people to come into this country for humanitarian purposes. But we need to do more. We've recently taken a significant step, which he referenced, which is to ensure that dependents of students cannot come uh, with students unless they're coming for longer uh, research degrees such as PhDs. That will make a tangible difference to the numbers in the years ahead. And most importantly, establishes or reaffirms the principle that universities should be in the education business, not the migration business. And no one should be coming to this country to study merely as a backdoor to a life in the UK. That's an entirely separate thing. But if there are further steps that we need to take, then we can and should do so. And he raised a number of important ones, which I will give further consideration to. He knows I have sympathy with respect to the salary threshold. There is a question uh, as to whether the immigration health surcharge is at a fair place or whether there's more that can be done there. And there's also a question as to whether family visas and so on are being issued appropriate. All of these are things that the Home Office keeps under review. And if we need to take further action uh, in that regard, then we obviously will do. Now, I'm conscious that he is keen to come in at the end of his debate in the final few moments. And so with that, Mr. Paisley, well, I will... Just uh, well, I will, but I, I only have a few seconds or else we'll deprive the right old member for... 1755 on the dot. Well, if, if, if the Honourable Gentleman comes in quickly... I'm, I'm grateful to my, my right Honourable Friend. Can he set out what the government believes is the right target for population of this country? Uh, well, that, that's, a, that's a big question to answer in 30 seconds, but what we have said is that we remain true to our manifesto commitment, that we will seek now to bring down net migration in the medium term, and he can see from the first step that the Home Secretary and I have made with respect to student dependence the seriousness to which we take this challenge. And I hope that I've said in, in my remarks that I'm very alive to this issue. I take seriously the profound consequences of net migration upon community cohesion and access to public services and housing. And that if there are further things that we can do, such as some of those raised by uh, our colleagues on this side of the House today, the Home Secretary and I will do everything we can to implement them. Thank you, Mr. Paisley. So, John Hayes, to wind. You've left Thank you, uh, Mr. Pace. The huge, fast population growth uh, may be seen by out of touch bourgeois liberals as a quick fix for our economy. But what the vast bulk of the public know is that it fuels the dependence on low skilled labour, stultifying our economy over time. The ease of employing workers from overseas displaces investment in domestic skills, including upskilling the existing workforce, automation better working practices and fair play. The consequence is to inhibit productivity and damage British competitiveness. But more than that, it changes the places we call home beyond recognition. Unless the government acts quickly and decisively, we face the grim future of a weakened, uncompetitive economy and a fragmented, disparate society robbed of any sense of shared belonging. The bulk of the public, regardless of their origins, know this. The minister, by his articulation of an excellent case today, clearly knows it too, and we know that the Home Secretary understands it. It's time the whole of government took back control. The question is that this House has considered the impact of immigration and population growth. As many as are of the opinion say aye, on the contrary, no. Order. Sitting stands adjourned.